मेरा रंग दे मेरा रंग दे बसंती कॉमरेड चेयरमैन कॉमरेड्स एंड फ्रेंड्स ऑनर्ड गेस्ट फ्रॉम इंडिया कॉमरेड पास नो आई एम वेरी इफेक्टिव इन पंजाबी बट आई हैव अ डिफरेंट रीजन फॉर स्पीकिंग इन इंग्लिश आई हैव एन इंस्ट्रक्शन माय पार्टी दैट आई एम टू स्पीक इन इंग्लिश बट देयर आर कॉमरेड्स फ्रॉम माय पार्टी हु आर रिकॉर्डिंग इट एंड वी वांट टू टेक द मैसेज ऑफ दिस मीटिंग टू अ फार आई वाइडर ऑडियंस योर फेसेस एंड योर मैसेज विल बी हर्ड ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ इट दैट्स अ रीजन फॉर स्पीकिंग इन इंग्लिश It's not a particular um, point of principle with me which language I, I speak in. So you would forgive me if I speak in English. Um, I don't know why I'm asking forgiveness. After all, we live in England, and there's nothing wrong with speaking the language of the people in whose country we happen to be living. Um, first of all, allow me to thank you for inviting me to speak at this meeting, and on my behalf, on behalf of my party. Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist Leninist. I am grateful to you that you have given us this honor of exchanging our ideas and views with you. Secondly, I'd like to take the opportunity of congratulating you on the 50th anniversary of the founding of your branch, the Greenwich and Bexley East branch of the Indian Workers Association, Great Britain. Unfortunately, our history is not very well known. The reason is we don't write that history. <coughs> There are a lot of people who don't write their history, and therefore people forget that they've done anything. But the Indian workers in this country, second to the Irish immigrants, have played the most important progressive role in the development of politics in this country. And, and we are very proud that we played that role. Personally, very proud that I was part of that movement which played that role. The reason we were able to play that role is that our program was correct. You know, with a correct program you can fail, but with a wrong program you can never succeed. The program of the Indian Workers Association basically had three points which are very important. We were in this country because imperialism had so exhausted our countries. so impoverished our countries that we couldn't find a living back home the majority of the workers came here not because they received a warm welcome not because they liked the climate of this country more than they liked the climate in india not because they found the food here better than they found in india the reason is poverty forced them out and therefore we from the very beginning have understood and it's a part of our program if you read the constitution of the iwa we have always been anti imperialist there is no struggle against imperialism going on in the world that we have not supported be it the struggle in south africa be it the struggle in zimbabwe as the information that you distributed mentions be it the struggle of the palestinian people against zionist occupation of of their country be it the struggle of the people of libya be it the, the struggle of the people in syria or the people of ukraine or wherever it might be we have been in the forefront of people who took this message to the british people that you cannot continue to be free if you will continue to oppress other people no nation no nation can be free if it oppresses other people this is our message secondly we come to this country we face racial discrimination first we're driven out of the country where we were by poverty by colonialism by imperialist exploitation and loot and then we come here there is racial discrimination so we had to organize to fight against racism this was something we did exceptionally well we mobilized local workers to support us in this struggle it's not a struggle that only indian workers or black workers generally speaking could have actually uh, been successful in it is a struggle that in that can only be successful with the wider involvement of the working class movement the question of racial discrimination is not something that just affects those who are discriminated against it also affects those who discriminate because a working class that allows itself to become a victim of perpetrating racialism 
itself becomes very weak. Racism divides the working class, and the working class which is divided cannot fight against its, its exploiters. We took this message, <coughs> and I think comrades who've been working with us would understand that we took it very successfully. There were demonstrations that the Indian Workers Association called. Before the anti-war demonstrations over the question of Iraq, we probably, since the 1860s, had the largest demonstrations. We had demonstrations of 150,000, 100,000 people. I remember in Berlin, personally, chairing a, meet, a, a demonstration of 100,000 people, not long, long, long while ago. And Indian Workers Association could achieve that because it was a vibrant organization which was involved in a living and organic way, not only with the Indian community, not only with the larger black community, but also with our friends who were not black. Eighteen-year-old Stephen Lawrence was waiting for a bus in Eltham. It was just 400 yards from where Rohit Dougal had been stabbed the previous summer. These boys came across the road and shouted that racist name. <laughs> and his friend said he had told Stephen to run, but Stephen didn't really see the danger, so he didn't run, but this other, his friend did. We think they used the word nigger. And when he looked around, he was just surrounded by these boys, and he just heard Stephen cry out. Stephen was stabbed a second time as he ran away. He ran for about 250 yards before he said, you know, I can't run anymore, you know, look what they've done to me, I can't run anymore. And that's when he collapsed. And at that point, I, I'm not sure if he died straight away, how, how long it took before he died. The tree that marks the spot where he died, the BMP has put their slogan on that tree. Anti-racist protesters had wanted to march past the headquarters of the British National Party in Welling, but police created an exclusion zone to keep them away. Violence broke out as some marchers tried to break through the police cordon. The march had gone off largely peacefully until it reached a suburban road leading to the BNP bookshop three quarters of a mile away. A section of the demonstrators surged forward in an attempt to breach the police lines and gain access to Welling and the BNP. Riot police reinforcements moved in to hold the line. Within minutes it turned into an ugly and violent confrontation. But despite police charges, the minority of rioters at the front held their ground. Mounted officers were deployed as the crossroads became virtually a battlefield. Then the confrontation settled into a pattern of police charges into the crowd, which were followed by tactical retreats. Police sustained injuries. So too did the marchers, a number of whom were also arrested. Some rioters wore masks and balaclavas to avoid identification. Others at the back of the march just gave up, turned round and went home. Two hours after the fighting had begun, the marchers finally began heading to a playing field for a rally. An Indian Workers Association could achieve that because it was a vibrant organisation which was involved in a living and organic way, not only with the Indian community, not only with the larger black community, but also with our friends who were not black, who understood that fight against racism is extremely important to their own position as, as, as workers. <laughs> Currently we are in this country not just black and black workers, we are workers, which means we share certain common interests with all the workers in this country. All the workers who are exploited by capital are our friends and comrades, and we have together participated in the trade union movement against austerity, against wage cuts, against encroachments of private capital and the national health, health, health service and all other areas. Capital abhors vacuum, just as nature abhors vacuum. Wherever it can smell a profit, it creeps in. And everywhere, even in the extremely well-loved institutions in this country like the National Health Service, wherever capital finds an opportunity, privatization takes place. They start with small things cleaning services, canteen services, etc., and slowly 
various services are, par are parceled off. And all the profits are skimmed by privateers who do the easy job when the difficult jobs are left to the staff in the National Health Service to conduct. And we have therefore always believed that we are part of the working class movement here and we will participate in all the struggles of the working class. The, you will not find a single example of a big trade union struggle. Big trade union struggle. Be it at the Hillingdon Hospital, be it of the print workers in, 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 in North London, be it of the print workers in Fleet Street, where the Indian workers have acted as scabs. Thanks to our guidance, they were always in the forefront of supporting the workers in struggle. And our role during the miners' strike of 1984-85 uh, is some <coughs> example to be, to be followed by everybody. We held, <laughs> we held meetings everywhere. We collected money. We mobilized the religious places and saying, you know, there's a tradition in our community where religious places provide free, free food. We asked them, mobilized them to provide free food. And thanks to them, they agreed with us and provided free food to the miners on plenty, plenty of occasions. Something that could not be taught to them by books and lectures was taught to them by practice. They, for the first, mining communities are quite insular. If you don't come from the same mining village, you are regarded as a foreigner, even if you are a miner in, in five miles away. So they were quite insular. But when they found black workers, Indian workers marching with them against pit closures, they became our friends. And they realized for the first time that it's not the color of skin, it's not the language of people, it's not the religion that they belong to, it's not their national origin which brings them together. It is the common economic interest of being workers and together exploited by capital. We've done these jobs very well. But I'm coming to the next point which you might find slightly controversial. But it is true, it has got to be said. Whereas we have done all these things very well, there is a time for transfer to a new and higher state. There was a time in the 19th century when the most important industry in Britain was the textile industry. Britain earned its living, apart from looting the whole world of course, by selling textiles. Britain doesn't do that anymore. We cannot, on the slogans of 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, continue to organize our political and social life on the basis of those slogans. We live in this country. When I was young, everybody of my age, and there's nobody here or anywhere in the world that's older than me, you know, I have lived so long. There was nobody who didn't feel that after four or five years of living in this country, they'll go back and buy a plot of land and live happily in India. We are no different from other immigrants. An average Italian who went to America in the 19th century also thought he'd earn some money in America, come back to an Italian village and settle. Did the Italians go back? 99.9% .9 did not. Have the Indians gone back? There are some who go back, and by the time they go back, they found their house and land has been occupied by their cousins and brothers anyway. <laughs> so there's, 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 really, there's really nowhere to go. You consider yourself Indian, they don't consider you, you Indian, right? So you live in a twilight world, suspended between heaven and earth. You don't know whether you're Indian or whether you're English. But let me tell you this, whatever people of the first generation of immigrants think, their children and grandchildren, we are into the third generation here, Whatever the color of their skin, they are English and they are here to stay. <laughs> they will sink or swim with the rest of the British working class. They don't have a se separate existence. They have formed friendships here. Some of them married across racial lines. If they haven't, their children will do. You are no different from anybody else. That's what's happened to every other, other, other immigrant. The whole idea that you think you will be able to live as a secluded community in Woolwich and have the same culture that you have in a village in the Jalandhar district is a pie in the sky it doesn't have. You must take part in the working class struggle of, of this, this country. And you must be in the forefront of all the struggles that are for progress of, of, of humanity. I always say to, to people, there are, we're not the only ones, there are Turks, there are other communities.
where they consider that they belong to Turkey. And the result is after the second generation, they have all fallen out of progressive politics. They want Turkish television. They live in Turkish areas and speak to each other in Turkish. They go to a local Turkish kebab house. And the only thing is they live in Harini. But the result of that is they're completely cut off from life in this country. People who have made this country their home and participate in the movement. And sometimes I think really that people who are right wing, who join the Labour Party, who join the Tory Party, join the Liberal Party, are ahead of us in thinking they at least participate in the movement in this country. And I say to my communist friends, if you don't want to join our party, for God's sake, go join, join the Tories at least. At least it will show you live in this country. What's the point of carrying on? I cannot be a revolutionary in Punjab, living here. Which means I simply cut myself out. I don't do any revolutionary activity here. In Punjab, I don't even live. Revolutionary activity is not conducted in celestial affairs. The spheres is conducted on earth, on terra firma, over here. And that means you must participate in this. There are a lot of things that are going on. And our community is actually beginning to disengage from them. Um, Comrade Dardi has mentioned, and Comrade Bajwa has mentioned, the chaos that is happening at Kerala. Immigrants. There's a great big hysteria. David Cameron says, our country is being swarmed by immigrants and asylum seekers. Does David Cameron want to give a reply? Does his defense minister, Mr. Fallon, give a reply to the question? You have bombed Libya into Middle Ages. You have killed the leader of that country. You have murdered him. You have murdered hundreds, thousands of people in that country. You have disintegrated that society. What is that society to do? Libya was a country where when Colonel Gaddafi came to power, the per capita income was $50 a year. When he was killed, the per capita income in Libya was $13,500, the highest in Africa. They couldn't tolerate it. They've destroyed it. They are, big. they are now in the course of destroying Syria. They've destroyed Iraq. Iraq had a standard of living which was equivalent to that of Spain and Portugal and, and Italy. They've destroyed that country. They've killed two million people. They made another four or five million internally and externally displaced. They've wrecked that country. And that's what they're trying to do in Ukraine as well. We, as people who have always fought against imperialism, must raise our voice against that. And everywhere there are demonstrations on this question, you must heed the call of our comrades and join those demonstrations. It's no point saying, I have to open my shop, I've got to do overtime. You know, that's not the whole of life. Human beings cannot just live by saying, I've got to live overtime. We've got to fully participate in making a better society. If there are immigrants in this country, it is because imperialism forced them to do so. And I, our party, if not the only, is one of the few parties that says there should be no ban on anyone traveling to this country to earn a living. They're not coming to loot this country. And we think the law of the market will take care of it. People will only come if there are jobs. People don't go to starve. People do not simply come here because they want to live off, 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 off the door. When Lord Clive went to India, did he go on a visa from the Muslim government to go and earn a living? I mean, their history is they go over and take over countries and they loot them. America is based on a successful, gigantic experiment in genocide. And now the Americans of all the people are saying immigrants shouldn't come. There's an idiot who's standing for the nomination of the, of, the, of the Republican Party, some rich man called Donald Trump, you know, hasn't got a single cell in his head. And what does he say? Mexicans are rapists and criminals. And he wants to build a wire on the Mexican-American border. And he said, I will make the Mexicans pay. Listen to me, he said. How is he going to make the Mexicans pay? Mexicans have better ideas of answering Donald Trump, i.e. not to vote, vote for him. Mexicans are a very important elect electoral force there. Similar things are happening in housing. Similar things. Immigrants are blamed for housing. We are not the problem for, for the lack of housing. Britain, under capitalism, always had a housing shortage. Read Engels' book, Condition of the Working Class in England, and see what the condition of living of the working class was. 
create the condition of a working class in the 20s and 30s when there were very few black people here, hardly any. It is capitalism that takes away housing and secure employment. It's not that other people are taking jobs. It is capitalism that's taking jobs. It's a capitalist crisis that is making it impossible for people to have jobs, to have houses, and better health system than already exists in this country. And therefore, instead of blaming our fellow workers, we have a duty to say that it is that. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of excitement and buzz. Because the election is being held for the lead, lead, leadership of the Labour Party. I'm not a Labour Party member. Have never been and never will be. Um, I do not wish in any way to, uh, for Comrade Edward to take it personally. This is my political view. I have put it forward for 50 years. And that is, Labour Party from its inception has an imperialist party, is an imperialist party, and whoever the leader, if Karl Marx himself was a leader, it will still be an imperialist party. That is our position. Labour Party cannot be changed to favour the working class. Labour Party's record, and this is really what the new election is about. The question is whether Labour should be Tony Blair's new Labour or it should be old Labour. Well, we have experience of old Labour before Tony Blair came. Labour started the Korean War. Labour started the Cold War with the establishment of NATO against the Soviet Union. Labour bombed India. Labour bombed China. Labour suppressed every national liberation movement. And Labour, of course, broke strikes in, in, in this country. We have no particular hope. Personally, if I was a Labour Party member, well, Corbyn stands head and shoulders above others. Not because he's a socialist, because the others are so dead. You know, they are not saying any, anything. But the basic thing is, instead of pinning your hopes on what the Labour Party would do if it elected a better leader, I invite you, friends, to join our party, the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marx and Leninist. We are small. We are not say, making boasts that you know we are the movers and shakers of the working class movement. But it never will be big unless people see the sense and join us. Right now, you tell me which party offers you a way out. Almost every party for which you can vote is a vote for austerity, is a vote for and I close my speech with the words that please help us become our members and if you think it's a step too far, we are constantly in need of money for our printing work, for our newspapers, for everything we do. Help us financially and with these words I thank you very much.